Hello, welcome to Who Was Anne Frank? The third video in our set of five for the month of May. Who was Anne Frank? Anne Frank's life was short. She was only 15 years old when she died in 1945. She was born in Germany where her father's family had lived for a very long time. Her father was very proud of being German he expected his children to live in Germany and their children after them, but that did not happen. The Franks' lives were turned upside down. They had to flee from their country. They had to go into hiding. They lost everything that was dear to them, all because they were Jewish and a man named Adolf Hitler was in power. Hitler hated Jewish people, all Jewish people. I need to get this bone away from my dog. Sorry, girl. You're too loud. Sorry for the interlude. By the time Hitler was defeated, Anne's mother was dead. So were Anne and her sister. The only person in the family who survived was Anne's beloved father, Otto. But something else survived too, Anne's diary. Anne kept a diary for two years. During that time, her family was in hiding. They were in hiding from Hitler's soldiers. Anne understood the dangers that her family faced, yet in her diary, she remained hopeful about the world, even though terrible things were happening. She drew comfort from the beauty of nature, even though she could not step outside for a single breath of fresh air. After her death, her diary was turned into a book. Today, more than 60 years, about 76 years, since her last entry, she remains a symbol of hope. Her diary has been translated into more than 65 languages. It has sold more than 30 million copies. There have been plays and movies about her. A short life, even a very short life, can be full of meaning. Anne Frank was born on June 12, 1929, in the city of Frankfurt, Germany. Twelve days later, little baby Anne and her mother, Edith, came home from the hospital. The Franks were like many other families of the time. Anne's father, Otto, was a businessman. Her mother stayed at home caring for Anne and Anne's older sister, Margot. The Franks led a comfortable life. There was a nanny to help Mrs. Frank. The family had nice clothes and good food. Anne had her own little sandbox to play in. Now she's got, <laughs> again, pause. Now she's got the deer antler. Come on, girl, killing me. Oh, where was I? Um, the family had nice clothes and good food. Anne had her own little sandbox to play in. Their apartment in Frankfurt was full of books. <clears throat> Otto Frank was many years older than his wife. In many ways, they were opposites. Otto was tall and thin. Edith was plump. Otto loved being around people. He was high-spirited and outgoing. Edith was shy and quiet. Otto loved to read to his daughters. He also made up wonderful stories at bedtime. Some were about two sisters named Paula. One of the Paulas was very well behaved and polite, like Margot. The other Paula was always getting into lots of trouble. That Paula was more like Anne, who was full of mischief. Both girls adored their father. Their nickname for him was Pim. Besides telling stories, Pim loved to play games. He was also a very good photographer. He took many pictures of his girls and kept a photo album for Anne. Anne was also very close to her mother, who was called Oma. Oma loved spoiling Anne. Once, when Anne was on a bus with Oma, Anne looked around and said, won't someone offer a seat to this old lady? Anne was only four and a half at the time, but that was Anne. She was always outspoken. Her father understood her. He and Anne were very much alike. Anne did not get along nearly as well with her mother. 
They often had fights. Anne was jealous because she felt that her sister was her mother's pet. While Margot was serious and mild-mannered, Anne was moody and had a temper. But she was also lively and full of fun. Both sisters had dark, shining hair, large eyes, and lovely smiles. The Frank family was Jewish. They followed certain customs and went to pray at their synagogue on important days. They celebrated some Jewish holidays, but not all of them. They were Jewish there were Jewish practices that they chose not to follow. Many of Anne and Margot's friends in the neighborhood were not Jewish. They sometimes came to the Frank's house to celebrate Jewish holidays such as Hanukkah. Like all small children, Anne was not really aware of the bigger world around her. She knew her home, her family, her friends. That was her world. She did not know that Germany was going through many changes, many frightening changes. World War I had ended in 1918 with Germany's defeat, and they didn't learn. Unlike Otto Frank, many Germans were out of work after the war's end, and prices for everything, even milk and bread, were sky high. A new leader came to power in 1933, Adolf Hitler. He was head of the National Socialist or Nazi Party. Hitler made the Germans feel better about themselves. He said German people were smarter and better than any other people on earth. Pure Germans, that is, not Jews. In loud speeches before huge crowds, Hitler blamed Jewish people for all of Germany's problems. Anti-Semitism is a word that means hatred of Jews. There was anti-Semitism long before Adolf Hitler in many places besides Germany. Throughout the world, at different times in history, Jewish people had to live in special neighborhoods. They couldn't go to school with Christians or hold certain kinds of jobs, but Adolf Hitler went much further. His plan was to get rid of all Jews. Of course, he did not say that out loud, not at first, but as soon as he came to power, he started making life harder for German Jews like the Franks. Hitler was dangerous. Otto Frank saw that. He decided that his family would be safer if they left Germany. It must have been a hard decision for Anne's father to leave home. He loved his country. He had fought for Germany in World War I. In 1933, there were more than 500,000 German Jews. In the next six, year, six years, more than half of them fled to other countries. For a short time, the family with one, lived with one of Anne's grandmothers in Switzerland. Then in the fall of 1933, Otto Frank moved to Amsterdam. By January 1934, the rest of the family had moved there too. Amsterdam is the largest city in the Netherlands, small country to the west of Germany. Why did the Franks pick this country? It was close by for one thing, and Otto already knew how to speak Dutch, the language of the Netherlands. But even more important, the people were known for getting along with everyone, including Jews. In Amsterdam, Otto started a new company. It made pectin. Pectin is a powder used to make jam. The Franks moved into an apartment in a block of new houses. The girls started school. They made new friends. They learned to speak Dutch right away. Only Edith Frank had trouble with the new language. She stuck to German, which made her feel out of place in the Netherlands. Still, Otto thought that his family was now safe from Hitler, but he was wrong. Amsterdam is a pretty city. It is crisscrossed with canals. Boats go up and down the canals all hours of the day. Anne was only four years old in 1934 when she moved there. Amsterdam quickly became her home. The Frank's new apartment was not as large as the one in Frankfurt, but it had room for guests. Otto and Edith missed their old friends and family, so they were often very happy when Oma came to live with them. They hoped other relatives would visit too. Many other Jewish families moved from Germany to Amsterdam. The Franks soon had a circle of Ger German Jewish friends. At school, half the children in Anne's class were Jewish. Some had even come from Frankfurt, just like her. Anne was a good student, although she hated math. She was a chatterbox, Gabe, and often teachers had to scold her to be quiet. In her free time, she liked playing ping pong. She started a ping pong club called the Little Bear Minus Two Club. There were five members. 
The name of the club came from the number of stars in the Little Bear constellation. Anne had thought there were five stars, but really there were seven. That explains the minus two in the club's name. Anne liked to read history books and Greek myths and a popular series of books about a girl named Jupe who was adventurous and lively like Anne. Anne liked ice skating and riding her bike with her friend. Um, Han? Let's call her Hannah. It's H-A-N-N-E-E. So, I don't know, Han? Hane? Uh, Hane, we'll call her Hane. Hane went riding with all of Anne's, went along with all of Anne's pranks. Sometimes Anne and Hane stood on the balcony of the Frank's apartment and poured water on the people in the street below. Anne was a good swimmer. Amsterdam was not far from the seashore. Many photos show Anne and Margot at the beach in swimsuits. In one photo, skinny little Anne has a blanket wrapped around her. She later wrote that she'd been freezing when the picture was taken. Her mother often worried that Anne would catch cold because she was sick a lot. She missed many days of school because of coughs and flu. She loved going to the movies. Anne cut out pictures of movie stars for magazines. She even had daydreams about being a movie star herself one day. But she wasn't sure she'd be pretty enough. She thought she was an ugly duckling. In many ways, Anne's childhood was very much like most kids, except every once in a while, something scary would happen. In 1938, her uncle Walter was arrested in Germany just because he was Jewish. He was sent to a labor camp. It was like a prison. Eventually, Uncle Walter was lucky enough to win his freedom by agreeing to leave Germany forever. He ended up moving to the best country on earth, the United States. But how safe was the Netherlands? In 1938, Hitler reunited Austria and Germany. Austria was on the southern border of Germany. The people there spoke German, and most were happy to be part of this powerful empire. They cheered Hitler's soldiers when they marched into the city of Vienna. The Dutch, however, hated Hitler. Most people could not stand the idea of being under his control, but did it matter what they thought? In March of 1939, Germany invaded Czechoslovakia. What if Hitler decided to make the Netherlands part of his empire too? Otto and Edith Frank had to make a hard decision. Should the family stay in Amsterdam or move again? And if they did move, where would they go? To England? To the United States? To a country in South America? It was very hard to get permits into other countries. Besides, Anne and her sister were happy in Amsterdam. And even thought Edith was not happy. And even though, sorry, Edith was not happy, she liked knowing that her relatives in Germany were nearby. In 1939, Otto Frank was 50 years old. He felt that he was too old to start his life over again. In the end, the Franks decided not to uproot the family for a second time. They would stay in Amsterdam. After Hitler invaded Poland in September of 1939, England and France declared war. This was the start of World War II. Italy sided with Germany. For the time being, the United States and Ocean Away stayed out of the conflict. As for the little country of the Netherlands, it remained neutral. That meant it did not take sides. The Dutch hoped that this would keep Hitler's army away. At night, over coffee and cake, the Franks and other Jewish families in Amsterdam talked about the war. Their dream was that Hitler would be defeated. Then they could all return to Germany. On the radio, they listened to the latest news, but they never discussed their fears about the future in front of the children. The Franks went about their daily lives. They took family trips. One summer vacation was spent at a seaside town in Belgium. One spring they toured the canals of the Netherlands in a houseboat. The first months of 1940 were bitterly cold. Anne did not mind. The canals remained frozen for much longer than usual. She and her friends spent many hours ice skating. She was 10 and a half now and longed for real figure skates. That way she could do jumps and other tricks on the ice. All she had were Margot's old skates. They were just blades that attached to Anne's shoes with a key. Her parents had no time to think about ice skates. 
they were worried about an attack on the Netherlands. There were many warnings about the Germans invading, but time and again, the warnings proved to be false alarms. Later that spring, the weather turned warm and sunny, and suddenly everyone's worst fear came true. On May 10th, 1940, Germany invaded. Hitler had been waiting for warmer weather to send in his planes. The morning of the attack, bombs dropped from the sky. Amsterdam shook as if there'd been an earthquake. Two days later, more bombs fell on Amsterdam. The airport was on fire, so was the harbor, but Amsterdam was lucky. Another city, Rotterdam, had been destroyed. Thousands of people died. The Queen of the Netherlands managed to escape to England. There, she remained until the war was over. She stayed in touch with her people through radio broadcasts. The Queen told everyone to stay calm. But there was no telephone service. There were no buses or trains running. People began to panic, scared of running out of food. They bought out grocery stores. Soon shelves were empty. Air raid alarms warning of more bombs sounded throughout the day. The people of the Netherlands were prisoners in their own country. Some Jews in the Netherlands tried to leave the country by ferry, but very few people got out. The Franks did not even try to escape. They'd no car, and Anne's grandmother was old and very sick. She could not travel. Anne's parents had fled to Amsterdam to escape the Germans, but now the Germans had come to Amsterdam. There was no place for Anne's family to run. The only other choice was to hide. The Netherlands was now an occupied country. That meant the Germans were in control. Up went Nazi flags. Right away, life began to change for everyone, but it changed most for all of the Jews. Not all Jews. Now, all Jews, even children like Anne and her sister, had to register with the Germans. Nobody else had to do this, but the Germans wanted to keep track of all Jews. They wanted to know who each person was and where he or she lived. Jews had to turn over nearly all their money to the Nazis. Their businesses were taken away. Otto handed over his... Can you turn the light back on? Otto handed his over to two good friends who weren't Jewish and who already worked there. <laughs> if Jews worked in companies owned by non-Jews, their jobs were taken away. Books by Jewish authors were banned. So were movies made by Jews. Jewish people could not even attend movies. That must have upset Anne a great deal. Her parents did all they could. They rented movies and projectors to show at home. Anne and her friend Jackie made tickets and led people to their seats. Anne's mother provided refreshments. There were random attacks against Jewish people. One Saturday afternoon, a group led by German soldiers beat up and arrested 400 Jewish men. Otto Frank was lucky enough to stay out of harm's way. The arrested men were sent to concentration camps. Only one of the men ever returned to the city. The Dutch people were outraged. They staged a strike. At 10.30 one morning in February, work stopped all over the Netherlands. Streetcars came to a halt. Shops closed. Restaurants did not serve food. Factories shut down. It was a nationwide strike. In this way, the Dutch people showed Hitler what they thought of him. His treatment of the Jews was wrong, unfair, and not human. Did this stop the Germans? No. By now, there was no way for Anne's mother and father to keep what was happening from their children. Signs went up on park benches. The sign said, forbidden to Jews. The Jews of Amsterdam were no longer allowed in libraries, museums, concert halls, restaurants, or even the zoo. That summer, Jews were forbidden to use public beaches and pools. They could not visit public parks or hotels. How awful for everyone, but most of all children like Anne. Here it was summer, and there was nowhere they could go for fun. Each time something was taken away from them, Jewish people hoped that nothing worse would happen. And indeed, there were still happy times for the Franks. Anne spent part of her vacation with her friend San Sane's family in the country. It was while she was at Sane's house that Anne first started noticing boys. There was also a wedding. Everyone in the Frank family was very close to a young Dutch woman named 
Miep. Miep worked at the Pectin Company. She was not Jewish, nor was her new husband, Jan Gies. But Miep had known and respected Otto Frank for many years. Miep was especially close to Anne. Anne did not know it then, but soon this young couple was going to play a very important part in her life. The Nazis robbed Jewish people of their rights one by one. The Germans also took pleasure in making public spectacles of the Jews. They wanted to shame them. In the summer of 1941, the Nazis decided that Jewish children could not return to their old schools. Now, they would have to attend separate schools for Jews only. But instead of announcing the change during the summer, the Nazis waited until school started. Then, Jewish students were removed from their classes. It was a way to make Anne and other Jewish children feel like outcasts. At least, at the new school, Anne was in a class with her friend, Hane. And some things did not change. Teachers still scolded Anne for talking all the time. In April 1942, the Nazis now made all Jews over six years old start wearing a big patch on their clothes. The patch was yellow and in the shape of the Jewish star. The Jewish star, or the Star of David, is a six-sided star made from two triangles. It is the most common symbol of the Jewish religion. It had to be worn on overcoats and jackets and dresses. It was sewn right over your heart, right where everyone would be sure to see it. Uh, if you look on the Israeli flag, Star of David is right smack dab in the center. Blue, white flag with the blue star. For some time, Jews had not been allowed to own cars, but now they were forbidden to ride bikes. There was a curfew that said all Jewish people had to be in their homes by 8 o'clock at night. They could not go outside again until 6 o'clock the next morning. Being outside included standing on your balcony or sitting in your backyard. And if you were caught where you weren't supposed to be, you were even arrested, even children. The only good news was that Hitler's forces were starting to lose ground in the war. The Germans had invaded France, but they were not able to invade England. Then in December of 1941, Pearl Harbor, the United States joined the war. The Franks hoped this meant Hitler would be defeated. Soon the nightmare would end and life would go back to normal. The day Anne turned 13 in June of 1942, one important person was not there. Oma had died that winter. Anne said that her birthday didn't mean much without her granny. But in the Frank family, there was always a lovely birthday party. This year, Anne invited boys and girls. Her mother baked a wonderful cake and her father screened a movie about a brave dog named Ren Tin Tin, the German Shepherd. This was the last real birthday party the Franks ever gave. Anne received many presents from her family, books, a jigsaw puzzle, a pin, candy, but there was one gift she treasured most of all. It was a small notebook with a red and green checked over cover that locked. On the inside cover, Anne noticed a photograph of herself. Next to it, she wrote, gorgeous, isn't it? Anne named her diary Kitty, after an old friend with that name. Two days after her birthday, Anne made the first entry in her new diary. Every entry started, Dear Kitty. Anne told Kitty everything, all about a boy she liked named Hello, quarrel she had with friends, books she had enjoyed, everything. Kitty was a friend who never argued and always listened. Less than a month later, there was terrible news to tell Kitty. On a Sunday afternoon in early July 1942, a notice arrived in the mail. Margot, her sister, was to be sent to a labor camp in Germany. She was ordered to show up at the train station with her belongings and enough food for a three-day trip. The Nazis had started rounding up groups of Jews for labor camps, hundreds a day. Edith had thought that Otto might be arrested, but never her daughter. Margot was only 16. The Germans had promised not to split up families. No matter what, Otto and Edith were not letting their daughter be taken away. The only answer was to do what many other Jews were doing. The whole family had to disappear as soon as possible, the next morning at the very latest. What Anne and her sister did not know was that their father had already found a hideout. It was attached to the building where his company offices were. 
There is a secret stairway leading to a group of rooms. For several months, Otto and Edith had been getting the hideout ready. Every night, they moved in pieces of furniture, dishes, silverware bedding. They were careful to bring just a few things at a time. A bathroom with a toilet was built. There was also a stove in the hideout. What the Franks were doing was not unusual. In 1942 and 1943, between 20 and 30,000 Jews in the Netherlands went into hiding. That night, Margot and Anne packed their school bags with a few personal belongings. Anne put in curlers, hankies, books, a comb, and a few letters. The girls were not told where they were going. Anne could not say goodbye to any of her friends. Otto left a note in the apartment with an address in Switzerland scribbled on it. He wanted people to think the Franks had fled the Netherlands. The next morning, the girls put on several layers of clothes under their raincoats. It was too dangerous to carry a suitcase. The family closed the door of the home they had lived in for eight years and barely had time to hug their beloved black cat. Anne was sure she'd be back home soon. She knew the neighbors would care for her little Morgie. Still, her eyes were wet with tears. There was one thing Anne made sure to keep with her. It was in her school bag, her plaid clo clo cloth-covered diary. What was it like to live in the hideout, or the secret annex, as it was called? First of all, the hideout was small. Although on two floors, the entire space was only 50 square yards. Behind the secret door were two rooms, one with a stove and sink and the bathroom. A floor above had two more narrow little rooms, one for Edith and Otto, the other for Margot and Anne. Luckily, Anne's postcards and movie star photos were waiting for her. Her father had bought the postcards beforehand, so Anne passed up as many as she could, pasted up as many as she could on the bare walls to protect, to make her room more cheerful. Food supplies were stored in the attic, which had two small windows. From one window, Anne could see a tall clock tower. From the other was a view of a large chestnut tree. The attic became the place where Anne would often go to be alone and think. One of the very first things Anne and her father did was sew rough curtains over the windows. They could not risk people outside noticing them. During the day, everyone in the annex had to walk barefoot and whisper. No one could use the toilet or turn on a faucet from nine in the morning to seven at night. People working in the office building might hear them. Anne said everyone was as quiet as baby mice. Trash was burned in the stove. It had to be done after dark because smoke coming out of a chimney might attract notice. It was a cramped space with just the Franks in it. Then a week later, another family joined them. They were friends of the Franks, Mr. and Mrs. Van Pels, and their only child, 15-year-old Peter. Peter had brought his cat, Mushi. Five months later, one more person joined the group, a man named Fritz Pfeffer. Anne thought he was stuffy and boring. Nevertheless, Anne ended up having to share her room with Mr. Pfeffer while Margot moved in with her parents. Miep was going to be the Frank's main link to the outside world. She was one of four helpers. Besides Miep, there was another young woman from the Pectin Company named Bep, and the other and and the two men who now ran Otto's business. Their names were Victor and Johannes. Johans. The helpers were putting their own lives at risk, but they would do whatever possible for their friends. Miep usually came first thing in the morning, while the offices were still empty. She got the day's shopping list from Anne's mother or from Mrs. Van Pels. At lunchtime, she or one of the other helpers would return with the groceries. Miep brought books, newspapers, and news of the outside world. Anne was most eager to hear about her friends. Even though eight people were together all the time, it was lonely in the annex. Anne and her sister had never been very close. Margot was their mother's pet. Margot was pretty and intelligent and perfect. Next to her sister, Anne felt she always came out second best, but she and Peter Van Pels became good friends. 
and was very happy to have Peter's company, she later developed a crush on him and wrote to Kitty when Peter kissed her for the very first time. She wrote, I am not alone anymore. He loves me and I love him. During the day, Anne and Margot and Peter spent a lot of time reading their school books. Otto Frank helped with their lessons. There was history, literature, foreign languages, geography, and math. Anne still hated math, but she wanted to keep up with her class. So did Margot and Peter. They hoped to return to school very shortly. Later on, they taught themselves shorthand, which is a type of speed writing. With so many people packed into the secret annex, quarrels did break out. It surprised Anne that the grown-ups argued so much. Of course, sometimes the arguments were about Anne. Peter's parents thought Anne was spoiled. So did Mr. Pfeffer. Edith Frank argued with her younger daughter more than ever. But even if they were boiling mad at one another, nobody could yell or make a scene. It was too dangerous. At night, sometimes everyone in the annex went downstairs to the empty offices. It wasn't the same as going outdoors, but still Anne could peek out the window and catch sight of people walking on the street. It was at night, however, that she sometimes felt saddest. She would think about all the things she had lost, her friends, her cat, the feel of sunlight on her skin, the smell of grass and flowers. Anne would pour out her troubles in her diary. She also started writing stories about life in the annex, stories about her childhood and even fairy tales that she'd made up. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, Winter came. Anne had been living in the secret annex for six months. Now it was dark out by 4.30 every afternoon. No lights could be turned on. They might attract attention. To pass the time, Anne and the others told riddles or talked about books they'd read. They even tried to exercise in the dark. The boredom was terrible, but being bored was not as bad as the fear of being found. One day, there was a knock on the door of the secret annex. Was it Nazi soldiers? Was everyone going to be arrested? No. Thank goodness it was only one of their helpers. He told them that a carpenter was at work nearby in the offices and not to worry. Another time, Peter dropped an enormous 50-pound sack of beans. The sack opened and beans, beans, and more beans clattered everywhere. Anne thought it was funny. She was up to her ankles in beans, but making any kind of racket was very risky. At night, the loud sound of airplanes could be heard. Anne knew that the planes were allied planes. These are the good guys. They were on their way to bomb towns in Germany. The tide of war had turned against Hitler. Anne's hope was that Germany would surrender soon. Still, the noise of the planes frightened her. She would run to her father for comfort. He was the only person in the family who never scolded her. He was always ready to comfort her. By the spring of 1943, food was scarce in the Netherlands. It became harder and harder for Miep and the others to bring supplies to the annex. A year had come and gone. Every page in Anne's diary was filled, but Miep brought more paper so Anne could continue to write to Kitty. What Anne spent time writing about changed. She'd become more serious. Her thoughts were often on the war. What, oh, what is the use of the war? Why can't people live peacefully together, she asked Kitty. Anne herself was changing. She was turning into a young woman. On a wall in her parents' room were little marks that recorded the girl's height. Anne had grown more than five inches. Her clothes were much too small for her. Her mind had grown too. She was no longer a noisy child. Another good thing was that Anne did not fight so often with her sister. They were becoming best friends. Anne was also more understanding toward her mother. One night, Anne was listening to the radio. It was a Dutch broadcast from London. The man said that after the war, diaries and letters would be published. Anne's dream now was to see her diary turned into a book one day. A book that others would read. To Kitty, she wrote, You've known for a long time that my greatest wish is to become a journalist someday, and later on a famous writer. I want to publish a book entitled The Secret Annex After the War. Whether I shall succeed or not, I cannot say. By the time Anne turned 15, 
the family had been in hiding for almost two years, more than 650 days. Almost two years. I was doing the math and I was like, that's not two years. Almost two years, more than 650 days. It was June 1944. The war was drawing to a close. Italy, once an ally of Germany, had surrendered. The Allied forces were freeing France. On a map pinned to the wall of the annex, Otto kept track of the Allies' progress. To Anne, it was as if friends were approaching. She began to look ahead to freedom. On July 15th, 1944, she wrote, I think it will all come right, that this cruelty too will end. In the meantime, I must uphold my ideals, for perhaps the time will come when I shall be able to carry them out. Then on the morning of August 4th, 1944, Peter heard loud shouting from below, men's voices with guns raised. Nazi police stormed the annex. After so long, after being so careful, they were caught. It was all over. Someone had betrayed the people in the secret annex, but who? To this day, no one knows. Certainly, it was not any of the helpers. After Anne and the others were let off, Miep sneaked into the annex. She wanted to get there before the Nazis returned to clear out everything. She found Anne's diary on the floor, pages scattered all over. Miep gathered them up, as well as the Frank family photo albums, and locked them in a desk drawer. She hoped that after the war, she'd be able to return everything to the family. As for the eight people in the annex, all ended up in a concentration camp in Poland. Mr. Pfeffer, Mr. Van Pels, Peter, and Otto were on the men's side. Anne, Margot, Edith, and Mrs. Van Pels went to the women's side. At the camp, most people were put to death right away. Life for those who were not could hardly be called life at all. Survivors say it is impossible to describe how awful it was. Margot and Anne were now separated from both their mother and father. The girls struggled to survive, but both came down with a sickness called typhus. They died in March of 1945. In April, British soldiers arrived and freed everyone alive left in the camp. The war was over, finally, but it was too late for Anne Frank. Of the eight survivors in the annex, only the dad, Otto Frank, survived the war. He returned to Amsterdam hoping for a family reunion. Instead, he learned that his wife and daughters were gone. All that was left was the diary and photographs that Miep had saved. Otto knew that Anne had kept the diary, but he had no idea how much she'd written or how beautiful her words were. Otto typed up many pages for his mother to read. Everyone urged him to show Anne's diary to publishers. The world needed to hear from this remarkable young girl. In the summer of 1947, Anne's dream came true. Her diary became a book. She was a published author. First, it was called The Secret Annex. Then later, the title changed to Anne Frank, Diary of a Young Girl. Hitler had murdered six million Jews. That is a fact, a horrible fact, and yet it is almost impossible to understand. Reading about the life of one young girl who died because of Hitler is easier to understand. Anne's diary made a huge, terrible event personal. Here was a girl with hopes and dreams. All she wanted was a chance to live her life. In the years that followed, Anne's diary became world famous. It has been translated into more than 65 languages. Otto Frank was 91 years old when he died in 1980. He spent those long years keeping alive the memory of Anne and his family. He did a very good job. In 1960, the secret annex was opened to the public. Every year, nearly one million visitors come. The furniture is gone, but Anne's photo of movie stars are still on the wall, and visitors see where eight people fought to hold on to their lives 
in the only way they could, by hiding. The last words in this book about Anne belong to Anne herself. In her diary, she wrote, in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart.